Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest rendition of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. Now, on to the science fiction. Story number one, Victory, written by Vass underscore. First human Granzic conflict of 312 AE, or War of the Binds, more commonly, lasted for 6 years, 8 months, and 14 days. Before the war, the Granzecs had submitted a declaration of war on the uncontact interstellar civilization with a war goal of total enslavement. This raised several alarms in the Galactic Council due to the possibility that the Granzecs would most likely not have a new species appraised appropriately and would exploit their monopoly on the new species in the black markets. Heavy pressure was applied on the Grenzik's government to compel them to allow for international observers on the war front. Reluctantly, the Grenzik's replied, and thus the International Observer Group of 56 observer vessels, one from all signatory states of the 603rd Galactic Convention, was formed and arrived on the war front three months after the war began. During the first year, Observers in the front lines reported not battles taking place, but the Grenzek seemed to make great progress in capturing systems which had been allegedly occupied by humans. But the startling silence raised great many eyebrows. Two years after the war began, and with a great pressure from the Galactic Coalition, Grenzek were compelled into granting observation access to after-action reports and fleet coordination systems. At the time, their data seemed to indicate that the same as the Observer reports. Nothing much was happening. It was only after the war when someone started connecting seemingly unrelated dots that the reality began to unravel. Grenzek economy had crashed during the war, their GDP tanking ever lower as the war went on. The cumulative casualties of the time were extremely high, even in regions nowhere near the war front, and ships reported exceedingly high rates of malfunction and damage. Even in the call sectors, where over 5,000 ships were sent for repairs during the first two years, their star bases repairing the ships also suffered notable but inexplicable damage and equipment malfunctions. For four more years, Gresnik fought on against the enemy that seemed to have neither fleets nor armies to defeat. Based on the captured facilities and colonies, most of which were abandoned by the time they were conquered, human technology was severely backwards compared to the Gresnik. Their small arms were powerful but crude, relying on small explosions in a contained chamber to propel a lead projectile, and even the largest of their military ships were weak and small, although vast. They were civilian grade by alliance terms and relied on crude mass driver weapons. When the end of the war was drawing close, the Grenzek polity had already nearly collapsed due to the internal strife amongst nobility and economic troubles in general. Their systems in the periphery had effectively gone dark by this time, which not only isolated their fleets operating in the actual war front, but everywhere else as well. Supplies to distant systems had stopped flowing since three years ago at a point well, general goods shipments seem to have remained intact in their call systems. Luxury goods prices had skyrocketed due to cargo ships carrying them spontaneously exploding in transit over the fears of war. By the time it was already too late, the Grenzik leadership tried everything in their power to get the council to send the coalition fleets to assist the quelling rebellions, and it was revealed that they had been trying to contact humans for almost three years to end the war. Their communiques had grown increasingly desperate in their tone, but they had been ignored time after time. In the final year, when the distant fleet's flow of supplies ceased, reports from their fleets grew less frequent and grimmer. By the time humans answered Grenzik's pleas, their fleets and systems they had conquered had all grown silent. During the first peace negotiation, Granzek leadership sneered at the robotic envoy human that had sent in a small, insignificant ship, and despite their predicaments, rejected the peace terms laid out by the humans. When the second peace negotiations began, several dozen human ships appeared out of nowhere, right in the skies of the Grisnik capital planet. 
They were small and insignificant ships, just like the one the diplomatic envoy had arrived in. But the fact that they could even enter the orbit of the capital unnoticed shocked not only the Gresnak, but the Galactic Council. Humans' peace terms in the second negotiation were even harsher, and its signing by the Gresnak would send ripples throughout the galaxy. The terms of peace were effectively a complete capitulation of the Gresnak polity. An empire rivaling the powers that stood at the top of the galaxy had fallen before some petty civilization in the galactic backyard. When they showed a human for the first time, however, on public broadcast, it was not a general or an admiral of their fleets who held their first ever speech to the galaxy at large. It was their president, a civilian who stood on a podium before the imperial palace of Gresnik and spoke of their values of freedom. His words were kind, but they were a declaration of war against the Galactic Coalition. Some might wish that they had learned something from the Gresniks before they went and actually declared war on the humans. Turns out human war planners had considered amassing armies and fleets and fighting battles head on obsolete hundreds of years before the civilization even got here to Stella. They had no great parades of amazing armies or fleets displaying their power in the form of dreadnoughts. Just tiny ships cloaked to perfection and armed to the teeth. Asymmetric warfare, the humans called their way of war. Cowardice, we called it. Years later, I remember when the Galactic Coalition dissolved and someone on the news asked a human general, quite literally, right after the humans had declared victory over the Coalition, how they could even show their face publicly when they fought like they have no honor. I don't think it matters what we don't have, it's what we do have that matters. But if you have no honor as a warrior, then what do you have? Victory, said the stone-faced general. End of story. Story number two. Strange Kin, written by underscore, underscore, dash, underscore, 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 dash, 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 underscore. There were always border squabbles with one planet or another changing leadership. It had to do with the political influence, as there were plenty of raw resources dotted throughout the cosmos. A species that couldn't manage resources never became an interstellar force. Those species rarely left the heliosphere. No, you invaded a planet to assert your own dominance, to prove that you were better than the former caretakers of the world. Artificial species weren't unheard of on the galactic stage, but it was rare for them to be front and center. His entire entourage was synthetic, and marred by what I deemed to be scars of war. That was rarer. Like a black and blue streak that took a particular palette to send artificial warriors as your first representatives to the galaxy at large. An artificial ambassador was what met me at the council. At the time, I had thought the entire earthen species was artificial. I expected calculated coldness, pitting coalition casualties against night of casualties. The galaxy might have grown past warring for resources, but warring for political ideals and domination was still a favored subject. I remember when I saw one armed synthetic Earthian ambassador break a table in half with a single blow. That ambassador turned his rage on one of its kin, a rage I've only seen in biological parents display. I'll always remember his words. What do you mean, my children engaged? That coldness of its artificial voice. I didn't know a fork's voice could be that cold. The laughter of its colleague was arctic. Aloud, aloud, there was more laughter. As though I could have stopped them. You're the oldest of us. You are half a millennium senior to the oldest human. She pinched the bridge of her nose. You taught them to do this. She turned to face one of the large white walls of the council chamber. What she displayed in real time was carnage he knew existed but preferred not to witness. Extermination at re-education camp, stripped bare, combat between biological beings shown in grotesque entirety, limbs decorated burnt and bombed moonscapes, burnt corpses with screaming skulls sung their torment to the sky above. Amongst the orphanists were biological Earthians. Earthians that held untenable positions so others could escape. That second Earthian synthetic stepped forward, addressing the coalition's leadership. 
Galactic representatives, we of Earth and her associated colonies are interfering in this latest instance of ethnic cleansing of uh, genocide. As she spoke, the real-time feed continued to play. My colleague has five children fighting in what you're presently witnessing, five non-synthetic children, sons and daughters that are just like you. They are not soldiers. They couldn't be farther from state actors. You'd call them pirates, scallywags, at best mercenaries. Yet there they are, getting shot to pieces to save a species the galactic community condemned because they weren't space-faring. She placed the presentation floor as the combat she displayed grew all the more frantic and brutal. Firearms were turned into expensive clubs, likewise helmets were used to bludgeon others to death. Earthian biologicals frantically repositioning, drawing security forces into new kill zones and choke points. Flanking and ambushings were sprung, flame-blazed explosives incinerated counter-attacking forces and denied lanes of advance. We love our siblings, her voice echoed through the council's chamber. Our siblings have been awful to themselves. They have done more than one atrocity to themselves. Because of that, we trust their judgment when it comes to genocide. That is why I cannot stop the Ninth Automated Fleet from engaging in operations in their support. No one can. She regarded the Coalition's representatives with the glowing yellow eyes. We don't expect the Coalition to join us, but we expect you to stay out of our way. Oh, the rage of an artificial being could display. If you think humans are brutal in their warfare, you have not seen us protecting our kin. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.